Welcome to our final presentation in this first of many chapter on stocks. <laughs> and in this presentation, we will discuss the various major types of common stocks. There are many more. We'll take a look at capitalization, a very important statistic that many people ignore. And then take a look at some investment strategies that people employ. So let's get started on slide 76. The largest companies, the most financially strong, the highest quality companies with long stable records of earnings and dividends are called blue chip stocks. Blue chip, where did the name come from? Well, believe it or not, it comes from gambling. <laughs> because you know, 150 years ago, 120 years ago, only gentlemen owned stocks. Very few of the hoi polloi, and very few women also, owned stock. It was a gentleman's uh, uh, purview. And gentlemen gambled. It's what a gentleman does. The blue chips were the most expensive chips at the time, and my understanding is that there are more expensive ones now. But still, that's where the name came from, if you can believe that. These are often referred to as value stocks, but we have to be careful because value means a different thing depending on who you talk to in the industry. They attract conservative investors. And now we're not talking about politics, folks. So, you know, leave the politics at the door. We're talking about investors who want the growth opportunities and dividend opportunities of stocks, but don't want to invest in speculative risky enterprises and some examples are general electric and general motors well it used to be and then it wasn't because it went bankrupt and now it is again but that new company is not the same as the old company anybody who owned the stock of the old gm well i apologize to tell you sorry to tell you that it, it is worthless now so these are the companies that we all have heard of, the name brands. They have the roots deep in the economy. Income stocks are sometimes associated with blue chips, but no, income is a little bit more specific because in, income stocks are stocks with long and sustained records of paying higher than average dividends. Again, be careful because sometimes these are referred to as value stocks. But as we'll see, value has a different connotation depending on who you're talking to. These are normally small, slow growth companies in mature industries. And what are we talking about? Utility stocks, railroad stocks. For decades, the banks, until the 1990s and 2000s, when the banks started to get exciting and sexy and almost brought down the entire economy, and I am happy to say, it's not complete yet, but banks are returning to their old boring status of income producing stocks. We're not completely there yet, and there's people who are still calling for more reform, but the banks are fighting it as much as they can, and they're very powerful. So we like income stocks. Do we like dividends? Right. Dividends don't lie, because <laughs> they sent you a check. Uh, well, no, it's all electronic now, but still, you know that they they paid that amount. All the other numbers, well, yeah, but that one you can be sure of. Slide 77, the growth stocks. These are the stars. These are the stocks that are on the cover of GQ and Vogue and Vanity Unfair because they have beautiful teeth and gorgeous hair, and pecs, and six packs, and 12 packs, and I'm looking for abs of oatmeal, folks. I'm trying to graduate from abs of porridge to abs of oatmeal, and then eventually to abs of uh, uh, jello. Uh, I know people have abs of steel, but not me. But anyway, the growth stocks are stocks that experience high rates of growth in operations and earnings. Growth rates of typically 15 to 20 percent, and that might not sound like much, but if you're growing at 20 percent, in about three years, you'll be twice your size. 
They are often associated with high P.E. ratios. Now, you remember price to earnings ratio? If not, go back and, and, and study that because we're going to be talking about P.E.s for the rest of the semester. They often have no dividends at all or a very small token amount. Why? Because most of the profits are being reinvested back into the company. The stock price should go up, but it's going to be very volatile. In fact, if you're into math and calculus, many investors don't look at the first derivative, that's the rate of growth, they look at the second derivative, they look at the rate of the growth of the growth. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But in other words, as soon as that company starts to slow down their growth, bang, exactly. The, the investors dump the stock, the stock price plummets, and then the value investors, as we'll discuss, start to swoop in and say, you know what, this is a good price, and the dance continues. Let's take a look at some examples. Intel, Microsoft, H wait a minute. Are Intel, Microsoft, and HP still growth stocks? No, they are now mature companies. In fact, HP is breaking itself up and selling off some of the parts to other entities and, other, uh, and, and, and spinning off themselves into other enterprises. Right, who are the growth stocks now? Right, the social disease. I'm sorry, social media companies like Facebook and Titter and uh, who else? Um, um, Tesla, you know, is growing like crazy. Netflix and uh, Amazon, Apple, these are the growth companies. I mean, Intel and Microsoft will say, hey, we're still growing. But not as they were 20 years ago when the PC and the PC revolution was taking hold. Exactly, exactly. Slide number 78. Now, I promised you we would discuss value and growth. And, and what we have to be careful is the usage of these terms by individuals in the industry because it depends on who you're talking to. The investment world loves to use the terms growth and value. But the meanings of the terms are not exact. Typically, what you will hear people or, uh, talk about or how they will use it is investors will often use growth to de designate a high PE stock while they use value to designate a low price to earnings stock. But you see, that's not the way I look at value personally, in my humble opinion. A high P.E. stock might be a great value, while a low P.E. stock might not be a good value. It has a low P.E. because it deserves a low P.E. price to earnings ratio. And so it's very subtle. And, and, and who you sp talk to will, will use these terms differently. So be careful. Here's an ex a perfect example, folks. You can't get a better example than this. In January of 2005, Google had just gone public uh, about eight months before. Google was selling for around $200 with a sky-high PE. I mean, it was like 70 or something like that, or, or, or higher. While the old GM was selling for $34 with a very low price-to-earnings ratio. I think it was six, five or six. Today, Google sells for around $1,600. That's split adjusted, folks. It doesn't really sell for $1,600. Uh, it has a much lower PE, still fairly high, but much lower than it was in those uh, early days. The old GE stock, which was renamed Motors Liquidation. First, they called it Liquidation Motors, but I guess GE. I'm sorry, did I say GE? GM. The old GM stock which which originally was called Liquidations Motors, and I guess General Motors got upset and they switched it around to Motors Liquidation, last sold for four cents in March of 2011, and now is worthless. So which one was the better value? You see that? You see the difference? You see the, people people tend to just lump all high PE stocks into growth stocks, and they lump all low price to earnings ratio stocks into value stocks. But just because a stock has a high PE doesn't mean it's a good value and just because the stock has a low PE doesn't mean it's a good value it's yeah it's subtle folks 
it's subtle. So you might want to read this slide over a few times and 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 um, relate, you know, and and um, and think about this. Um, uh, ruminate. There's a good word uh, about about this this um, this conundrum here, this little puzzle, this little paradox we have in the industry, this little idiot synchronicity. Slide number seventy nine. Now, we're going to take a look at some other types of common stocks that you'll hear people, investors, discuss. Cyclicals. Does that mean the company's round? No, 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 no. <laughs> Cyclical stocks are stocks whose earnings and overall market performance are closely linked to the general state of the economy. These stocks follow the business cycle of advances and declines. So what are great examples of these? Automobiles. The, 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 the economy is improving, wages are going up, productivity is going up, you get a new job, you get pay raises, what do people do? They run out and buy a new car. <laughs> and, and how's the old car? I don't care, I want that new car smell. It's good for your lungs and good for your liver and brain cells. Um, if the economy is not doing well, people are losing their jobs, right. Do people buy new cars? No, Bessie's doing just fine. Thank you very much. And it turns out that pretty much any company now that makes stuff, materials, timber, steel, chemicals, and now computer chips, right, because everything has computer chips in them, those are now cyclical companies because as there's more stuff being built and more um, uh, need for materials, those companies do well. And when there's a decline in the economy, a recession, there's less demand for material and stuff. And so these don't do well. On the other side of that coin are the defensive stocks. Defensive stocks are stocks that tend to hold their own and they even can do well when the economy starts to falter. What? That doesn't make any sense. Well, yes, it does. The people who invest in the growth stocks and the cyclical stocks and are, are more trading, more speculative, they will dump the growth stocks, dump the cyclicals, and run into defensive stocks. Why? Because they're defensive. <laughs> These are the companies that remain stable during declines in the market. And they are often associated with income stocks, but not always. And, and these are, tend to be the consumer products companies, like Kellogg's, like Procter & Gamble. Do you eat more cornflakes? Do you wash your clothes more often because the economy is doing well? Do you eat fewer cornflakes? Do you wash your clothes less often because of it? No. Also, the drug companies, but they're a little more tricky. But... but it doesn't matter, folks, how the economy is doing. You need insulin, you take insulin. It's that simple. So the drug companies tend to be lumped into the defensive stocks. But they're, they're, uh, they're, they can be more um, uh, tricky because of the, the enormous amount of money they have to put out to put a new drug. And if it's a, if it's a blockbuster, they, they tend to zoom. And if it's a dud, they get hit. And so st uh, drugs have their own little cycle of, uh, of product cycles that can make, that can make or break the stock, but they tend to be defensive because for the stock the drugs that you need you take them no matter what's going on in the economy. Slide number eighty. Now a few other uh, types that I want you to remember. Oh, by the way, before I forget to give credit where credit is due, I took most of these from um, Peter Lynch in his book One Up on Wall Street. So, uh, there are others. There are other places where you can read about this, but he does a really good job of describing these, and so I stole it from him. And if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Okay, turnaround stocks. I call them goners because most turnaround stocks don't turn around. But there are times when a company has fallen on hard times, and there is a potential for a rebound. And you have to be you know, tricky. You have to do. You have to dig deep and see if that company, if you believe that company is going to rebound. Most of you weren't alive in the early 1980s, but Chrysler almost disappeared. And they were. People say they were bailed out by the government. They weren't bailed out by the government. What happened is the government, the United States government, backstopped the loans that were given to Chrysler to to reinvigorate the company. And the, the Chrysler paid back all the loans, 
so the loans were guaranteed like a student loan like same idea the government did not want Chrysler and several hundred thousand people losing their jobs and it turned out a gentleman by the name of Lee Iacocca and I think he's, he's still alive uh, but he's long since retired you want to if you're into business if you if you want to learn more about about good business people and uh, great case studies you want to read his autobiography it's a little self-serving but or just read about him because he was he was the guy who created the the Mustang back in when he worked for Ford and then he turned Chrysler around and uh, I think the price went down to about three dollars and three or four years later it was back up to 47 so hey and then Ford and GM are now I think I think they're back and they they, they seem to be uh, you know competing out there and then they were almost gone all three of them were almost gone in 2008 and you'll still talk to people who said we should have let them all fail well I don't think they understood if you let them fail not only are you going to lose all the jobs for them, you're going to lose all the jobs for all the companies that supply them with the parts because they don't make most of the parts. They mostly assemble the car, but they don't make the, the catalytic converters and they don't make the airbags and they don't make the, the, the fabric for their uh, their seats. And they do, they, 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 yeah. So, uh, no, you know, you can't go back and let them fail and then see what would happen. But I think the government did the right thing. They didn't help themselves by flying in their private jets to Washington the first time to beg for money. That was stupid. The second time they took the bus, right? <laughs> All right, now the asset plays, the asset play stocks. These are companies that are sitting on an asset that could be sold or spun off, but but you don't know it. You 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 see the face of the company, but you don't know what's sitting behind there and and this is why you really have to do your uh, your investigations into a company that you're interested in. For example, J.C. Penney's. You know, J.C. Penney's it's a, it's a department store, right? Well, no, they have a lot of other businesses, and one of their businesses is very profitable. It's an insurance company. They're the ones that try to sell people life insurance for their children, with yeah, it's just a useless <sighs> form of insurance, but it's very profitable, and yet. Uh, in J.C. Penney's, if they really did go under, and a couple of times they almost did, they made some really stupid mistakes. They could have easily sold that uh, insurance company and kept themselves afloat. The last slide, I mean, the last bullet on this slide is penny is penny stocks, folks. Folks, stay away from these things. These are the Butterfly.com and the Flim Flam Incorporated, and they make blue steam and bacon stretchers and left-handed smoke shifters and it's gonna be big folks it's gonna and now they're into marijuana they're making all kinds of products for marijuana <laughs> this is the wrong side of the tracks the red light district the bad side of town and if you saw the wolf of wall street or boiler room this is what they were selling companies that are not real companies slide number 81 foreign stocks international stocks well these were traditionally difficult to almost impossible to transact. So what, because you had to move your dollars into the currency and usually get a brokerage account in that country and then buy the shares on that exchange. And so what our wonderful individual uh, entrepreneurs in New York did for decades is they would buy a ton of of shares in Europe or in Japan and then bring them to the United States and then reissue them as what are called American Depository Receipts, ADRs. So you go on the New York Stock Exchange, you look for Toyota. Toyota's on the New York Stock Exchange, but no, it's not the Toyota shares that they sell in Japan on the Tokyo Exchange. They're depository receipts, sometimes called, I say, I've seen them called GDRs, Global Depository Receipts. Oh, I've seen that also. And so they're essentially the same shares, but they're denominated in dollars. Many people didn't bother. They would just go ahead and buy their shares globally or internationally through mutual funds. But now more and more brokerage firms, our broker, the, fir the firm I work for, specialize in helping people uh, move money around the world 
and have international brokerage accounts. They should be called global brokerage accounts because you can still buy stuff in the United States, but they're called international brokerage accounts. And what you can do in the brokerage account is easily move your dollars into yen or pesos or euros and then on those exchanges buy and sell the shares. Now, that makes it easy for you to be a global investor, but <laughs> are you aware of all the issues that are going on in that particular country with that particular company? Maybe, maybe not. And that's why I like to invest globally through mutual funds because they have huge um, um, resources and people based all around the world. And I don't know if I can compete with them. Now, one of the things that you must think about, and we've discussed this and we'll discuss it again, it bears repeating, is what happens with the currency. Over the long term, I think these things wash out, in the currency issues, but not always. It's a counterintuitive um, uh, inverse relationship. If you invest outside the United States and the dollar gets stronger, all other things being equal, and they never are, the, your, your investment outside the United States goes down. If the dollar gets weaker, it has the opposite effect. Your investment outside the United, United States becomes more valued. It, become, it, become, it becomes worth more. And if you go down to Mexico at all, you have family or whatever there, you have experienced this. Right now, the dollar is very strong. And you go down to Mexico, and boy, your dollar goes really far. But if you had owned property in Mexico, you would see the value of your property fall relative to the dollar. Now, it's still, you know, it's still whatever it is, whatever it's worth in Mexico, in pesos. But now, those pesos don't buy as many dollars as they did in the past. So personally, I think it's an excellent time to go buy property in Mexico or to invest globally because the dollar is very strong. It could get stronger. It probably will over the next couple of years because the United States is still the best house on a bad block and we're st we still have some of the highest interest rates in the developed world. And so people tend to flock toward those higher interest rates. However, I don't personally believe that the dollar is going to stay this strong forever. doesn't mean I'm right. But what you see are that currencies move in cycles. Sometimes those cycles are long, which is why I think in the next 5, 10, 15 years, the rest of the world will eventually catch up with us and the dollar will, will, will lose some of its uh, strength, which is actually, and you might hear people say this, talk about manufacturing. It's actually good for manufacturing companies and companies that sell their products in the United States, I'm sorry, companies in the United States that sell their products outside the United States? Exactly, because it makes their products more competitive. So it's a dual, it's a dual um, edge sword. Sure, it may, it's great for American tourists going abroad, but it's harder for American companies going abroad. Slide 82 capitalization oh boy this is an important so you might want to take a break it's up to you uh, because this is important get your calculator out get get a piece of paper and go take a look at those um, those worksheets in in chapter uh, five worksheet number three right worksheet number three uh, capitalization is a very important statistic a very important number that people don't tend to forget or not ignore they simply look at the price of the stock they don't look at what the stock is worth. And wh wait a minute, Frank. He said, wait, the stock is worth whatever the price of the stock is. Yes, but that doesn't tell you what the company is worth. What that tells you is the price of the stock. You have to know how many shares there are. So the capitalization is actually a very simple calculation. I want you to learn it. I don't understand why some people have a hard time with this. It's simply the price of the stock times the number of shares that are out there in the world. And there are three major categories. The papa bears, the mama bears, and the baby bears. And if you can remember that, you should be remember be able to remember large cap, mid cap, small cap. 
Do you remember the mutual fund categories? Right. <laughs> and so this is one of the problems of teaching mutual funds before you get to stocks. Large cap stocks are generally regarded, depending on who you talk to, anywhere of $10 billion and up. And you hear people saying, no, it's $20 billion now because the, price, you know, the, the values are getting more and more. But I, generally, let's stick with $10 billion. There is a subcategory, which you don't have to remember, but I hope you do, and that's called mega caps. Any company that's above $100 billion, you know, the Walmarts of the world, the GEs, those are called mega cap stocks. Right, so if you don't remember that, that's okay, but I wish you will because you'll see a mutual fund called mega cap, you know, mega cap mutual fund, and they invest just in the largest companies. Then there are the ba the mama bears, the mid caps, and it depends on who you talk to, anywhere from one or two billion. I hear more and more people saying that two billion is the, is the starting point for mid cap, but some people still look at a billion dollars upwards of 10 and I've heard some people say you know 15 20 billion that's where you, that's mid cap now so it, it, it changes over time but these are the you might have heard of some of these others you probably haven't heard of and then the small cap the baby bears most of these you've never heard of a few of them and that's anywhere up from about a hundred million to, to one or two billion once you get below a hundred million then you're looking at a subcategory of small cap stocks called micro cap. And again, I hope you remember that. It's not as important as just knowing that they're small companies. And then we shouldn't even include this in polite company, but these penny stocks are often much less than a million uh, or maybe a few million dollars, but most of them are just not worth anything. So stay away from those penny stocks. So here's an example. If a company is selling for 20 bucks, how much is it worth? Well, I don't know. You have to tell me how many shares there are. In this case, uh, this number of shares is 5 million. There are 5 million shares outstanding. So you multiply the price times the number of shares and you get $100 million of market capitalization. And that sounds like a lot of money. Well, to you and me it is. But in the investment world, this is a very small company. In fact, it's on the fringe of a micro cap stock. Dear students, the stock price for the most part is irrelevant. It becomes relevant when it gets down into the 20 cent range or a dollar or less than a dollar or 20 cents, then just stay away. But you must look at the market capitalization to see what the value of the company is worth. Remember Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. E e there are just not as many shares of Berkshire Hathaway Class A. That's why the shares are worth so much. He's never split them. But the other companies that have been around for 100 years, Ber you know, Coca-Cola, 125 or 30 years, and the, and the GEs and the Johnson & Johnsons, they've been continually splitting their stocks so that there are far more shares out there. Yeah. So there are some problems in worksheet number three that we would normally do in the face-to-face -face class. So make sure you do them because they may be on the exam. But more importantly, you really need to understand this. Now, in the when you actually do your research, do you have to do this calculation? No. It's one of the things that, that pops up in front of you on the screen or, or in, on the uh, materials in the library. It, they tell you what it's worth. They do the calculation for you. So here we have a couple of mom and pop uh, stores that you might have heard of, Walmart and Target. And as of uh, the 6th of uh, September 2016, you look at the stock prices and you think, wow, Walmart and Target are about the same size, right? Well, no, you know they're not the same size. Walmart is much bigger than Target. And indeed it is in the investment world. There are th over 3 billion shares of Walmart and only 574, five or so, 575 million shares of Target. So Walmart is six times bigger than Target, right? $225 billion, a mega cap stock. Now, Target is still a large cap company, folks. It's still a large company, but, but it's much smaller than Walmart. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Make, make sure you internalize that. 
um, reflect upon it, as they say in the uh, educational world. Uh, let a couple other uh, you know, companies you may have heard of, AT&T and Verizon, the duopoly, but there is some chinks in their armor, much to my uh, delight. Uh, but no, they're still the two dominant players in the United States. And they're thinking globally, folks. You go down to Mexico now, you see all kinds of ads for AT&T. They're moving into Mexico, so I'm sure they're they're thinking about other markets, or they're, they're more than thinking about them. So you look at these and you think, well, Verizon's a little bit bigger than AT&T, isn't it? Well, not really. They're up both very large. Um, there are 6 billion shares of AT&T. There are 4 billion shares of Verizon. And it turns out that AT&T is actually bigger. Not that much bigger, but they're both mega cap stocks, right? Because would any of you young millennials give up your cell phone and <laughs> funny 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 it's like taking away your air <laughs> you, ah, you can't they can in the classroom they can't even turn it off it's it's like that that computer from 2001 turning them off is like killing them you won't even you we won't let anybody turn them off and and the millennials won't let them won't let anybody turn off their cell phone <laughs> Okay, no, I apologize. All right, slide number 86. Let's uh, finish our discussion here with talking about different investment strategies. One of the oldest and still, my humble opinion, the best is called buy and hold, folks. You use fundamental analysis. Now, what is that? We'll discuss that in detail in Chapter 6. But we've already done a little bit of fundamental analysis by looking at the price to earnings ratio by looking at the dividend yield by looking at the capitalization we are starting our our journey of fundamental analysis now we're going to do much more we're going to dig much deeper into the uh, the companies but still we're just scratching the surface folks you use fundamental analysis to identify high quality companies with good growth prospects and potential for dividends at reasonable prices. Sometimes you'll hear people call this value investing, but be careful. Remember, remember the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the syncricity, the idiots, the idiosyncrasy of, of calling value stocks only P low PEs. If you're a buy and hold investor, there's nothing to stop you from buying a, a, a high P.E. stock if you think it's a good long-term value. You might hear people say growth at a reasonable price, which I think is kind of cute because it, they'll say GARP. And then there was a book and a movie called The World According to GARP. It's actually a very good book. I didn't see the movie. Uh, Hold it forever, Mr. Warren Buffett says. Well, now, he was being a little tongue-in-cheek, a little facetious, because you don't live forever. But in other words, dear students, if this is a company that you believe you would want to own all the shares, you'd want to own this, you'd want to own FedEx. Yeah, I'd like to have that company. Fine, buy 100 shares, or however many you could afford, and hold it for the long term. As if you were buying a pizza shop, or a shoe, shoe shop, or whatever and be a partner in that business and then someday yes you're going to need the money to to live off of or to make a major purchase or whatever but still don't rent the company for a weekend or for a month or for six months and one of the things we show in the face-to-face -face class now is a quick little uh, um, document called don't lose perspective and i do hope you go run to the website and take a look at it because it's a it's a real eye-opener eye it shows you throughout the 90s the stock market on a month-to-month -month basis the world actually I think this is the world index on a month-to-month -month basis and it's it's just insane folks if you tried to make any kind of investment decisions on a month-to-month -month basis you would just be you know, just you would just drive yourself insane but then it shows you the year-to-year -year return and you go, ah, okay, <laughs> okay, I see. Hold it for the long term. We're long term investors. I think so. Slide number 87, the income strategy, which is yet another very good in strategy, which tends to dovetail with the um, uh, buy and hold folks. 
sometimes called equity income. Remember the equity income mutual funds, stock, dividend, right? They emphasize dividends over capital appreciation. And ideally, you're looking for growth of dividends because companies that pay consistently growing dividends tend to do well when the market as a whole does poorly. Remember the equity income funds? They held up very well in 2000 to 2002. They, they got clobbered like everybody else in 2008, but they fell far less than their growth counterparts, their growth uh, cousins. And it turns out, folks, stocks which have had histories of consistent dividend increases have often been the best long-term investments. Right. In, in any given time, there are these growth companies that are skyrocketing and everybody jumps on the bandwagon. And, but then they re invariably, the second derivative slows down <laughs> and people dump the shares. Whereas these conservative, stodgy companies, the oatmeal, as we called it in Chapter 4, tend to hold on and do well, very well over long term. And remember, we discussed DRIPS, dividend reinvestment plans. Oh, these guys work so well with dividend reinvestment plans. Okay, and we'll take a look at some of these in Chapter 6. Slide 88, the growth strategy. The stars, everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon as a company is experiencing strong growth. Subsequently, the stock price is bid up to very high levels. <laughs> Typically, they are also the stocks that are the riskiest. When the slightest hint of a slowdown in the growth appears, the stock price is often brutally punished. If you go back and look at Netflix over the last few years, you'll see that it is just, it's a real roller coaster, folks. Dividends are a secondary concern. These companies have above average forecasts. They usually have high price to earnings ratio in expectations of higher earnings in the future. So go ahead, buy all the growth stocks. And as some people have some I have one student in in <laughs> who's just always telling me, but you gotta know when to get out. I, I, well, the one the other student said, yeah, but that's that, that's like being at the poker table. You gotta know when to fold. You gotta know when to leave. It doesn't always work that way. You get it. You get you get you get into the excitement, and all of a sudden the world falls out from underneath you. I'm not trying to tell you not to not to do growth strategies. There are growth companies that are very very useful, and and and, and not just useful, very profitable. But be careful. Be very, very careful. <laughs> Slide number 89. Aggressive growth strategy. Speculation. Short-term trading. Investors aggressively trade in and out of stocks in order to achieve eye-catching returns. Instead of waiting three, four, five years for a stock to move, an aggressive stock, stock trader would go after the same investment return in six months or, or less. Some traders have time horizons in the weeks or days, and now, as we saw with the high-frequency traders, there are companies who are using the computers to make millions of trades per day. And I think this is what people think they're supposed to do when they start investing in stocks. They figure they need four monitors and three computers and be hooked up to all these different things, and they're going to buy and sell and buy and sell. Folks, it is fraught with perils and drawbacks, not the least of which are the serious transaction costs that you're going to generate as a result of frequent trading. Stockbrokers simply adore suck. I'm sorry, I'm uh, 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 traders who use this strategy. Why? Because it generates commissions and yeah. So good luck, dear students. Don't let me stop you from doing this, but. I can't help you other than to point you in certain directions. Read Mr. Jesse Livermore's uh, a book about uh, speculative uh, investing, which is an oxymoron, speculation. And uh, good luck. Slide number 90, the contrarian strategy. Now, this is actually a very cool thing to look at and realize that most of us will not be contrarians. We just don't have the resources, we don't have the patience. 
These are individuals who invest in stocks that are out of favor with the market for some reason. There's that term, value, you know. As reflected by low price to earnings ratio and low prices compared to their fundamentals, to the to the numerical measures that we've looked at in this in this uh, chapter and we'll look at it in chapter 6 and subsequent chapters. Contrarian investors actively seek stocks from companies with sound financial statements that the market has undervalued. And one famous contrarian investor said it this way, I always try to be accommodating. I buy when others want to sell, and I sell when others want to buy. The problem is it ain't easy. The market typically rises three, four years for every one year that it falls. So if you're always selling where everybody else wants to buy, eventually you won't have any shares, right? And as one famous, uh, other famous investor, uh, contrarian investor said, look, it's not a steady business. You have to be able to have the patience to sit on your hands and wait for blood in the streets. Wait for the market to just crash hard. And then you see the contrarians with big smiles on their faces. And you think, what, what, what do they know that I don't know? Everybody else is, is, is glum. And no, they're, they're out there looking at the companies and saying, wow, look at that one. I'm going to buy that. Look at that one. I'm going to buy that one. <laughs> and what I want you to do is take a look at the, uh, and there's a, um, the Benjamin Graham's Financial Network, right? It's, com it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a hoot, a bit of a spoof from, uh, the Intelligent Investor, the newer versions where J Jason Schweig has written a commentary after every chapter of Mr. Graham's prose because he's hard to read. But then Jansen, Jason Schweig swoops in. He's a very good write, financial writer. And he gives a commentary. So it's from that. And he talks about how if you're a long-term investor, you love it when the market crashes right but most of us are just we don't have that kind of cash laying around we're putting in 50 bucks 100 bucks more if we can afford it through our um mutual funds yeah so so we're sometimes we're buying high sometimes we're buying low but for individuals like this like warren buffett who put his money where his mouth was and in 2008 when the cr crash occurred he swooped in and bought $5 billion of GE, swooped in, bought $5 billion of, uh, um, no, of uh, Goldman Sachs, bought $10 billion of Bank of America, and all of them have done very, very well for him. Thank you very much. And I want to tell you that with regards to contrarian strategy, I've been a bit of a contrarian when it comes to real estate. My wife, when we first got together, was terrified of stocks. I don't blame her. And she said, why don't we invest in real estate? And I said, because it's too darn expensive. If I'm going to, we already have our own home, so that's, we have some investment real estate. But, but it's our home. We don't tend to sell it. But if I'm going to personally invest in a investment property, I want it to be cash flow positive. I want it to generate enough money so that it pays all the bills and then leaves me with a little bit left over or maybe a lot of it left over. And that just wasn't the case for almost 20 years in the United in the United, in San in San Diego. Thank you very much, Chula Vista. And then in the 2000s, it just became insane. You know, people were never even thinking about the rent; they were just thinking about buying it and selling it within a year, flipping the the property. But then 2008 came along, in 2009, and all of a sudden the prices fell off a cliff. And I went to my wife and said, oh, dear, let's take a look at investment property. And she said, ah, you finally got me <laughs> convinced to, to relax about stock. Now you want to invest in investment and in real estate? And it turns out that was a good time to invest because now if you look at the prices, they have come back up to the point where now it's not smart <laughs> or no, I shouldn't say smart it's not going to give you a cash flow positive return on your investment you're going to have to either just accept zero re, zero dollars or negative cash flow which means you're putting more money in that it's than it's generating so check out the contrarian strategy folks I I think it's 
a very good one, but it's it's just hard for we mortals to do. Now, a few others, dumb, dumb, and dumbest. <laughs> the sector rotation. You buy the hot sectors and you sell stocks in the stale ones. Well, which ones are the hot ones? Are the ones where you're going to get burned, and you're going to sell the ones in the stale ones just in time for the hot ones to go cold and the stale ones to get hot. Momentum investing. This goes along with aggressive growth. Buy stocks as they go up, sell them as they go down. And sometimes short the stocks to make them go down even further. This is associated with aggressive growth and aggressive trading, speculating. It's sometimes called the greater fool theory. Uh-huh, right, exactly. Somewhere there's a greater fool than I who will buy my shares that I bought high and they will buy them higher. This is what was going on in the real estate market in the mid-2000s. There's a greater fool out there. I like to think of this as musical chairs. Sure, while the music is playing and everybody's drinking and getting drunk on the, uh, on the profits, it's great. But then as soon as the music stops, right, you're just going to get squashed. And then the last one, we've already discussed market timing. Uh, I think it's something you should avoid if anybody tells you they have a good market timing scheme. You, you just, you know, say thank you very much and hold on to your wallet. And uh, don't listen to me. Listen to Bernard Baruch, who was a very famous investor in the mid-20th century. Don't try to buy at the bottom and sell at the top. It can't be done except by liars. In other words, people who say, Oh, that fish was this big! <laughs> it was... Yeah. So, can you identify the risks inherent in each of these strategies? Hmm? Do so. And slide 92, finally, which strategy do you favor? In the face-to-face -face class, we would ask people, and they would all say buy and hold because that's what they thought I wanted them to say but I hope I have at least tilted your inclination toward long-term prudent investing but hey it's your money and there you are dear students we have finished our introduction to stocks this is just the beginning and this stuff is the stuff I want you to know in this chapter you need to know everything because you are going to be awesome investors and you are now the investment gurus for your family and friends and you can't let them down, right? Plus, you now have ammo in your arsenal when the people in the three-piece suits try to uh, flim-flam you. Indeed. Now, are you ready? <laughs> because in our next chapter common stock valuations we are going to learn some techniques that are going to knock your socks off that are going to fill your head with incredible ideas and in my humble opinion are going to tilt the odds in your favor see you in our next chapter on common stock valuations <laughs>